This video is sponsored by Policy Genius. Oh, hi. In this week's video, I'm not going to show you how to make a table. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to make two tables. That's right. Now, I never make furniture for anyone else anymore. I just usually do it for YouTube. But this is one of those rare instances where someone twisted my arm hard enough and I got roped into making two gigantic tables for a local church. You know, Jesus. Anyways, I'm gonna walk you through exactly how I made both of these tables in four days. It was a little crazy. Make sure you watch the video, check the links in the video descriptions for all the tools and stuff that we used, follow along. Don't forget to go over and sign up for our Patreon account. And uh, we got another channel, Bourbon Bites. You might wanna check that out too. Okay, let's build two tables. Now, originally, this wasn't going to be two tables. Originally, this was going to be one 18-foot long table because that's what they wanted. They came to me and they said, hey, we want you to build an 18-foot long table. And I said, no, that's dumb. Let's build two 9-foot tables because then you can move them around and push them together if you really want an 18-foot table, but you'll have more options. Plus, I'm not going to have to kill myself to try and make an 18-foot long table. So I designed this table in SketchUp, and we're going to make two of them. Nine feet long each, equaling 18 feet. Now whenever I do a solid wood table like this, I try and do the things that are going to take the most time first, and just get them out of the way. For this, one of those things is my legs. There's going to be eight legs in total, they have to be glued together to create solid blanks, so I needed to cut a bunch of pieces and get my leg blanks glued up so that I can start milling them. Eight legs. That's a lot. So I took some six quarter white oak over to my miter saw station and I started breaking it down into leg size pieces. Making sure to cut my pieces a little bit long so that after I get them all glued up I can cut them to the final length. There is one piece. Yeah, one. I need I don't know how many more, but a lot more. Because I'm using six quarter white oak, I figured I can use three boards to get one four by four leg. So I have one leg, two leg, three leg, four leg. These pieces are wide, so five, six, see, two, seven, eight. Eight legs total. Now that I have all my pieces roughly cut to the right length, I trimmed them down to the right width, roughly, over on the table saw. And when I say roughly to the right width, I want my final width to be four inches, so I left these at four and a quarter. So I could still play with them a little bit and get to my final four inches. And when I say play with them, I don't mean like pretend they're toy soldiers and send them off to battle. I mean mill them down after I glue everything up. With all of my pieces cut roughly to the right width, I went over to the planer. And you might be thinking, why didn't you go to the joiner? Don't you want to get them perfectly straight, nice, and clean? Well, the truth is, I really don't need them to be perfect yet. I just need them the correct width. I left them just over an inch and three-eighths thick. Because an inch and three-eighths times three gives me just over four inches. So I set to work planing. And planing. And emptying my dust collector. Because... Well, I made a lot of dust, and it fills up pretty quick, but somebody's got to do it. Once all my legs were planed down, I stacked them neatly over on my table to just double check and make sure that I do indeed have eight leg blanks ready to go. And sure enough, if you can count as well as I can, you can see that I have all eight leg blanks ready. Now, to save time, I decided to glue these up in pairs, two legs at a time, which is easy to do. You just gotta make sure when you're adding your glue, you don't accidentally glue the two legs together. So, you need to put glue where it needs to be, and don't put glue where it doesn't need to be. That's wisdom right there. 
before I added glue, because I didn't take the time to send these through the joiner, I wanted to put some clamps on all the blanks and just make sure that I would indeed be able to bring them together with the clamps. That's all that matters, is that I can get all those joints nice and tight. Once I was sure that I could, I grabbed my glue bottle and I set to spreading some glue. Now, when I was a younger man, I'd use my finger to spread glue. But in my old age, I've gotten, you know, tired of getting all icky. So I started using a plastic squeegee. Works pretty good. With glue in all my cracks and crevices, as well as spread evenly onto my white oak, I clamped everything up securely. And then moved on to the next set of legs. Because I gotta do this multiple times. Now, as you can see, those legs, they're wonky and bowed, and that doesn't matter yet. Because once we put the clamps on, boom, they all come together and can be glued up. That's all we care about right now. Pretty soon I had all eight of my leg blanks in clamps and all I had to do was wait for the glue to dry. The next morning I came out to the shop first thing first and I took my leg blanks out of clamps. One quick drop on the table and they were separated into individual leg parts and they were looking beefy. I'm not sure why, but it's very satisfying dropping these on the table and watching them separate. I now have eight leg blanks that I can mill up into perfect four by four legs, but I'm not gonna do that yet because I have ADHD and I can't stick with one task for too long. So I'm gonna set my legs aside and rip off my jacket because I was hot. T-shirts available on our website, belly not included. With our legs set aside, Craig was kind enough to help me figure out our tops. Now these are long, big pieces of six quarter white oak. So they're heavy and I didn't want to haul them around all by myself. Now each top is gonna to be nine feet long by 36 inches wide. So doing the math, I figured I'd need six boards cut at six inches wide to make up one top. Now, normally with long boards like this, I would order them straight lined, meaning they already come with one straight clean edge on one side. This makes my life a lot easier because I can just go right to the table saw and rip them down. But I forgot to order the boards straight lined so they all came rough sawn. So before we could do anything, we had to put a straight edge on each and every board. Now you might be asking, why didn't we just do this on the joiner? Well, have you ever tried to wrestle a nine foot piece of solid six quarter white oak through a joiner? It's not fun, but there is an easy way to do it. And that's just to pull out the track saw, stick a straight track on one side and cut a straight line. So that's what we did over and over and over again until we had 12 boards, six for each top in total, with a straight edge, and then we could go over to the table saw and cut them to width, which if you were paying attention earlier, you already know is six inches. Now, normally I would cut these a little bit wider so that I could clean them up on the joiner but I was so happy with the cut we got off the track saw, I was pretty confident that if we were careful and went slow, we could get a nice glue cut right off the table saw. So I was very careful and I went slow. And sure enough, we managed to get some pretty nice edges. Now, instead of trying to glue up the entire top, all six boards at once, I figured the easier thing to do would be to glue it up in two sections, two sets of three boards. This meant that I could just glue up three boards before I even planed them down. I didn't have to worry about my seams lining up that good because three six inch boards only equals 18 inches wide. And lucky for me, I have a 20 inch wide industrial planer. So after I glue up my three board sections, I can just take them over to the planer and clean them all up and bring them to their final thickness. Now I did want to get the seams as good as I could. So I took some of these handy dandy Rockler clamps. I love these F body clamps and I clamped them on each seam on the ends. This helped align my boards. And then as I applied pressure with the clamps, well, I knocked the seams down with a mallet. 
you know, just to get everything as even as I possibly could. Once we had the entire thing in clamps, we wiped the glue off the top of our slab. And once we had the glue wiped off the top, we lifted it up and I used that same wet rag to wipe its bottom. Um, sorry, that sounded weird. I, I used a wet rag to wipe the gooey stuff off its bottom. That didn't sound any better, did it? Once our slabs were all dry, we pulled them out of clamps, and as I mentioned, we took them over to my 20-inch helical head joiner, and we just pushed them on through. Watch those imperfect seams disappear into oblivion. Actually, not into oblivion, just into small, tiny little particles in my dust collector. But it didn't take long. We got all of the slabs run through the planer. We brought them down to just over an inch thick, and, ha, huh, you thought I was going to say we then glued them together into their full widths. But remember, I have ADD, so we abandoned the tabletops for now, and I went back to working on the legs. Sue me. After running each leg through the joiner on two sides to get them nice and square, I then went over to the planer, and I milled them down on the other two sides, bringing each leg down to exactly four inches by four inches. This didn't take too long, and in no time, I was ready to take those legs and, well, set them aside, of course, and get back to working on my tabletop. So I grabbed my pre-milled up tabletop pieces, and we stuck them on my workbenches. Now, we could just squeeze some glue in between these and clamp them together, but I was worried about that seam in the middle not lining up quite right. And they were already at the thickness we wanted them to, so I didn't want to have to sand the bejesus out of that seam to get it perfect. So this is where I had the perfect solution to our uneven seam problem. We'll just throw a few dominoes in that one seam. Not for strength, just for alignment's sake. Because if you put enough dominoes in there, well, that seam's kind of got to come together pretty perfect. So I pulled out my little domino joiner, and I started just, you know, making a bunch of holes on each side. And because I know you're going to ask, yes, of course, I used my patented hip thrust technique, and it worked pretty darn good. With all of our holes mortised out for our alignment dominoes, as I'm calling them, all we had to do was spread glue on our one seam, insert our dominoes, and push both pieces together. Not only did gluing these up in sections make our life so much easier when it came to getting everything glued up, it also saved us hours in sanding time because they were pretty smooth right off the planer. So all we really had to do was clean up that one seam in the middle. I gotta say, Craig was a huge help getting these things wrestled into place. And most of the time he was right there next to me all of a sudden he wasn't and then I looked over and remembered oh yeah Craig's got like 27 kids and it's a miracle he gets any work done anyways after gluing up our first tabletop we did the exact same thing to our second tabletop a little glue a few dominoes and boom they were both in clamps and the next morning they were all dry and ready to go so I pulled off the clamps and using my track saw, I trimmed both tabletops down to the right length, just at nine feet. Trimming tabletops to length might be my favorite thing in the entire wood shop. You just take this rough board with jagged edges on both ends, you stick a track on there, and all of a sudden, the piece is transformed into a perfect rectangle. And you know what they say about rectangles? They're like squares but longer. Once I had the tabletops trimmed down to the right length, I could sand them. And by I, I mean I made Craig do it. He's still kind of getting the hang of sanding. I'm not sure he's doing it right, but he's getting the job done, so who am I to complain? While Craig sanded the tabletops down, I worked on milling up the wood for the base. I already had the legs all milled up, but I needed pieces for our apron and a nice long stretcher that will connect, you know, underneath the table. 
it'll it'll stretch because it's a stretcher. After I had all my pieces milled up and the right thickness, I cut them all to length as well as my table legs. I found out that my capex maxes out right at four inches. I mean, I could barely cut through these legs, but I managed, even though it's not the prettiest looking cut, but it's the right length and that's all that matters. So with that, I had all my pieces for my stretchers, my legs, my aprons, and now all I had to do was assemble it all into a table base. Oh, hi. This video is sponsored by our good friends over at Policy Genius. Now, if you're like me, you might be getting up there in years. I'm nearly 36 years old, but I don't feel like it. I still feel like a kid half the time, a little teenage boy running around with nothing to do. But that's not true. I have responsibilities, whether I like to admit it or not. And one of my responsibilities is making sure that my family is taken care of if something were to happen to me. So I knew I needed to find a life insurance policy. Now, finding a life insurance policy can be a pain. It's a daunting task. Where do you start? Where do you begin? Who do you go with? There's all these people out there. Well, that's why Policy Genius is awesome because they make it super simple to find the right policy for you and they take all the hassle and worry out of it. Now you might say, oh, I've got life insurance through my work, but your work might not be enough coverage to make sure that everything's taken care of. So you're gonna wanna check out Policy Genius. If you don't believe me, just look. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed agents are not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal information is private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Now you might be saying, wow. I never knew. That's great information. That's awesome. But where do I go to sign up and get started? Well, that part's easy. You just do this. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com slash bourbon moth or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. I want to give a big thanks to Policy Genius for sponsoring this video. And speaking of videos, Let's get back to ours. Now, originally, when I was thinking about joining my table base together, I was going to use the domino joiner. But then I decided not to, because you guys always complain that it's so expensive. I mean, it's $1,600 for one of those things. So I decided to change it up a little bit and use my new tool, the Panto Router, because it's only $2,300. So I thought it would make everybody a little more happy. Now, if you're like, what the heck's a Panto router? Well, a Panto router is a mortise and tenoning machine. Well, it does more than that. It's basically a pattern router. See, it creates a mortise by riding in the track here. What happens up there on the back corresponds to what the router is doing down below. You see, you use one hand to push the router in towards your piece. It rides in that red track that I showed you a second ago. Use your other hand to move the router back and forth and Voila, you have a mortise. Pretty cool, right? So I use this machine to create all the mortises in my legs to attach my apron pieces. I took the little dust shoe off so you could see a little bit better how the machine works. I slowly push the router forward. It rides in that template on the top to create the exact size mortise that I want. I move it back and forth until I get to my final depth and boom mortise. Pretty darn slick. In no time, I was able to create all the mortises I needed in all eight of my legs. You just got to make sure to keep everything in the right orientation, obviously, so that your aprons go in the right direction. Once I had all my mortises done, it was time to do my tenons. Now I use that same template that I used for the mortise, but this time, instead of the little guide riding on the inside of the template, it's got a bearing and it follows the outside of the template. I just keep going around and around until, boom. I carve a perfect tenon that corresponds exactly to my previous carved mortise. If you don't believe me, 
Watch this. Tenon meet Mortis. Mortis meet Tenon. Ooh. Ah. It even works great on the long apron pieces. All I needed to do was add this little roller bar in the back end to support the piece while I carved the tenon on the opposite side. I was even able to use it to do these cool vertical mortises to connect my stretcher piece underneath the table. No, this is not an ad for Panto Router. I was just excited because I got a new tool and thought I'd play around with it. Will I use it on every project? Probably not, but I gotta say, it was pretty darn easy to carve out all my mortises and all my tenons and it only took me about maybe an hour and a half, two hours. So with all my mortises and tenons cut on the Panto router, before I hooked everything together, I wanted to shape each piece a little bit more and just soften all the edges. So I added a nice little chamfer to the bottom of each one of my legs. This helps prevent any chip out when you're dragging the table across the floor. And then I took this really small eighth inch roundover bit from Bits and Bits, and I just softened each and every edge of absolutely every single piece. This just breaks down the edge and, you know, keeps anybody from getting splinters. Because nobody likes a splinter. I mean, even real woodworkers, they get a splinter and they're like, ow, a splinter. And when no one's around, sometimes we cry. I mean, we're human, like anybody else. While I broke down all the edges, Craig was such a champ and sanded all the pieces. But don't worry, when I was done breaking down the edges, I went over there and, well, I drank whiskey and watched him sand. <laughs> I mean, it's not like I'm gonna help him. That'd be crazy. There's whiskey to be drunk. Come on, man, get to work. Don't got all day. Little did I know that as soon as I left to go make some phone calls, Craig also got out some whiskey and began drinking while he was sanding. But I mean, I can't blame him. Sanding's the worst. And it definitely is better if you got a nice glass of whiskey in your hand to help pass the time. Anyways, eventually we had all the pieces sanded and we were ready to start our assembly. Because we had taken the time to sand every piece prior to assembly, I really wanted to try and avoid squeeze out of glue as much as possible. So I took my time, I used a little paintbrush, and very carefully I applied glue to each tenon and inside each mortise. Once I had them all lathered with glue, all I had to do was slide the pieces together like giant Legos. I was really impressed with how accurate the Panto router was able to cut all these mortises and tenons. I left them just slightly big enough that I could have a little glue in there. Plus, glue tends to swell the tenons, so you have to account for that. But once you get it dialed in, everything really just fit together nice and snug, and I was confident that this piece was gonna be rock solid. There was such a nice friction fit with my mortise and tenon that I really didn't need that much clamping pressure. So I just stuck a few little F-body clamps on each cross piece and set it aside and waited for the glue to dry. I decided to glue up all of my end caps first because I thought it would be easier than trying to glue up the entire table base at once. So while we waited for the glue to dry on those, I thought we'd use this time to put some finish on the bottom side of our tables. So I threw a few of these Rockler Bench Dog cookie thingamawatsits into my workbenches to raise the tabletops up off the work surface a little bit. And then we put a nice coat of this Rubio Monocoat Mudlight on the bottom of each table. I always think names of colors are just hilarious. I mean, come on people, what the heck is a mud light? That's not even a real thing. There's a night light, there's a street light, but in all my years, I have never once seen a mud light. But it is a nice color, I'll give them that. After buffing that mud-like color into the bottom of each table until our arms were sore, we took some rags and wiped off as much excess as we possibly could. And then it was finally time to assemble our bases. 
The glue had dried on our pre-assembly of each end, so I pulled all those pieces out of clamps, and I set them up in the middle of my shop, which seemed to be getting smaller and smaller by the minute with each piece of this table we were getting assembled. Now I thought long and hard about the best way to do this last glue up of the table base, because the base itself is like eight and a half, almost nine feet long. And then I decided to just stop thinking and start rubbing glue everywhere, which is just good advice for life in general, let's be honest. So I rubbed glue on one side, Craig rubbed glue on the other side, and then Craig held the wood stable while I inserted it into the mortises. I know this sounds weird, but I don't know of another way to describe this, because that's just how it went, okay? Deal with it. Anyways, we started with that bottom stretcher. Once we had that in place, Craig set that on the floor, and then we moved to the upper aprons. Now we couldn't set these on the floor because the angle would have put too much stress on those tenons. So Craig had to hold one piece of the apron, and then he had to hold the other piece of the apron while I guided the tenons into the corresponding mortises. Once I got all that done on one side, Craig kept holding onto that wood, and then I moved over to the other side, guided those tenons into the other mortises, and we had one table base assembled. The only trick now was how in the world were we gonna get clamps on this thing? Cause I don't know about you, I don't have nine foot clamps just laying around my shop. I mean, does anybody? Before we worried about clamping, however, I did take a square and just double check that our table base was well, square. And then, as far as the clamping problem went, we just grabbed two clamps and made them hold hands in the middle. Like two lovers on a date, walking down the beach at sunset. The moon was out, the stars were bright, and they knew, despite the world's problems, that they'd be okay. Sorry, I got a little off track there. After waiting for the glue to dry on our bases, I took everything out of clamps, and then I wasn't quite done yet. I wanted to add a few little brace pieces in between those long aprons because, well, they were long aprons, and I didn't want them to be bouncing all over the place. So I went real simple. I just milled up some three quarter inch white oak, and I used some pocket screws to just hold the braces up underneath the table. Sure, I could have used some fancy mortise and tenons inside, but you're not gonna see them. And I was tired and lazy. The last thing I needed to do to this base was create some sort of system for attaching my tabletop to the base itself. So I grabbed my domino joiner with the five millimeter bit in there and I used it to drill out a few mortises. You might be saying, why? why why'd you do that? Well, it's because I'm gonna use these Z fasteners to attach my tabletop to the base. This is my preferred method for attaching tabletops because it allows for seasonal wood movement. Next, I went back over to my tabletops themselves, and after flipping them over, I applied another coat of Rubio to the top of each tabletop. It was late at night at this point, and I could have stayed up even later and put Rubio on my table bases, but I knew that Craig was coming to work in the morning and I could just make him do it. So that's exactly what I did. Craig shut up and I said, hey Craig, I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee. Why don't you put finish on each table base? But being the nice boss that I am, I came and drank my coffee next to him while I watched. So, you know, win-win. With all of the bases completely rubioed up with that non-existent mud light, whatever the heck that is, all we needed to do was put our tops on the bases, attach them with those Z fasteners, and these tables were done. I have to say, I don't like to toot my own horn that often, but we were able to build both of these nine foot counter height tables in just four days, which is pretty good. I mean, you should be very, very impressed with me at this point, even though I did make Craig do most of the work by himself. So 
if you were going to give anybody credit, it should be me for being smart enough to delegate. That's an important thing. <laughs> ah! That doesn't work as well when you can see under the table. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. I hope you learned something. That was fun, cool, crazy, wacky, stressful, descriptive word, two tables in four days. I don't want to do that every week. Anyways, check the video description for links to all the products and tools and everything that we used. There's also a link down there to our Patreon page if you want to support the channel in another way. And also, Bourbon Bites, if you're not over on our second channel, things are really popping off over there. You're missing out all of our same content in bite-sized form. Make sure you go subscribe over there as well. Now i got to figure out what to do with these tables so I can have my shop back. Jesus?